Hi, everybody. It's noon on Wednesday, and you know we like to get started on time. So uh, welcome to today's Academic Leaders webinar. I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school at One Schoolhouse, and I am excited to be joined by my friend Carol Everett, the executive director of the New Jersey Association of Independent Schools. Hey, Carol. I'm so happy to be with you, Brad, and with your, with your academic leaders as well. Thanks for asking me to be with you today. I am thrilled and I'm so excited for people to get your thoughts on today's important topic of institutional loyalty is eroding. Um, and we're going to focus this, as you'll see here, uh, in particular around uh, student retention and faculty retention as we get into the conversation. I've got a couple of housekeeping notes for everybody here right at the start. Uh, on our blog, I uh, wrote a blog piece over the weekend about institutional loyalty eroding. Um, We'll go over to the blog to check that out. Next week, our topic is going to be uh, uh, related to a portrait of a graduate um, going beyond the traditional portrait of a graduate and rethinking outcomes for learning. A couple of other housekeeping notes. There's a lot of, uh, of discussion going on currently on the Academic Leaders Listserv. If you're not a part of the Academic Leaders Listserv, jump on over to oneschoolhouse.org slash academic-leaders-listserv to sign up. Uh, our communications team wants me to remind you that if you don't get the webinars, or if you don't get our weekly newsletters as well, uh, to go over to the blog and sign up for them there. And we have a online professional learning course that is starting up soon on the advanced independent curriculum. This one is specific for academic leaders. Finally, as you all know, during the, uh, our weekly newsletters, we ask a pulse question. This week we've asked as an academic leader, we wanna know how your focus on retention has changed given the current generation of students, faculty, and staff. So as an academic leader, how is your approach to retention evolving? Carol and I are gonna come back to these results a little bit later on uh, in our conversation, but they are fascinating. We're really seeing many, many more academic leaders focusing specifically on retention of faculty and staff um, with a fewer, a smaller percentage focusing even more on students and families. Okay, well, Carol, uh, and, oh, sorry, two other quick housekeeping notes for y'all. Uh, closed captioning is available using the closed captioning button on the bottom of the screen. And we use the Q and A's for questions that you may have as we go through. Don't use the chat for questions, use the Q and A so that we can monitor those as we go along. Okay, Carol, I wanna start by bringing us a little bit pre COVID pandemic. And I'd love for you to set the scene of what was happening within New Jersey independent schools prior to the COVID pandemic. Brad, I was worried about a number of our schools, particularly the small pre-K through eight schools. They were not having the best time yep. with enrollment and many, quite frankly, were fragile. I thought before the pandemic and the infusion of PPP funds um, that a few of those would close. Mm -hmm. So pandemic was not a happy time. Now, shall we segue to what, how are things in New Jersey now? Yeah, I mean, it's just so much has changed, right? In the last 20 months. Uh, let's get into like, what are things like in New Jersey right now? You know, Brad, it's mainly good news from mm -hmm. New Jersey. Most of the NJAIS schools are thriving. Mm -hmm. like, here they were in person, most of them, most of the time, and they have profited by the flight from New York City and Philadelphia to the suburbs. So many of our schools, including these fragile pre-K through eight schools, are at least 20% up in enrollment this year. Wow. Others, especially the big schools, have waiting lists. So it's a it's a good news picture from New Jersey for the most part. You know, Carol, let's let's pause on that for a second because you, you noted a couple of trends in there that that are not unique to New Jersey um, and have great impact on what is happening in schools right now. Um, you noted uh, that reliably schools were in person as much as possible, and then also that there's really a demographic shift that's happening across the country 
with folks moving away from the city to suburban areas, to more rural areas um, as well. And, and those, are, those are not, this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because this is not uh, uncommon throughout the country right now and causing big changes to what's happening in schools. The other thing, Brad, that we don't want to ignore is how schools benefited from the PPP loans. Mm, mm -hmm. mm. Oh, that's interesting too, yeah. Do you wanna talk more about that? Um, that a lot of boards of trustees were reluctant mm. to take those, the PPP one, um, but for the schools that did, it made a huge difference in their bottom line. Hmm. Hmm. So it stabilized them at a, at a time of uncertainty. Particularly because who budgeted for PPE, you right. know, buying plexiglass and, and, and masks and hand sanitizer. So um, to get the additional funds really was a benefit for, for schools. And yes, NJ, uh, the New Jersey schools can be very much a microclimate for what goes on elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, any lessons learned from those schools as they've, uh, as they've seen that increase in enrollment? Well, I think one of the things that you and I are going to hit on as a common theme today is the theme of retention. Mm -hmm. That a lot of attention has been attention to retention. Great. Well, let's just let's jump into one of the other things that I know we wanted to hit on today, and that is um, the big quit has uh, been a big, big topic of conversation. Uh, I know at one schoolhouse and across the across the country. Uh, as we've seen more, more and more folks uh, resign from their current positions. Uh, have you seen that reflected within New Jersey independent schools? And, and what's that been like? Absolutely, Brad. Um, Forbes had that article back in June about the big quit. And then there was the other one about the great resignation. Yep. It has had an impact over uh, on our schools. I think over the years, heads of schools have gotten used to the August meltdown. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of families who may be transferred or decide to move out of town and you lose maybe one or two faculty members, but boy, this year it really hit hard. And, and schools were hiring new faculty and administrators almost up to the first day of school. Um, teachers and administrators would get closer to that first day and either have anxiety and fear about being back yep. um, or just decide to make a different life decision. In general, though, I think the start of school this year has been overall quite positive. But one thing I want to underscore, Brad, as I'm thinking about this academic year, is that I think it's going to be harder than last year. Hmm. Talk more about that. Parents have higher expectations. They're, they think, well, last year you delivered through a pandemic. Now do more and better. Hmm. And that that level of parental expectation coupled with students with high anxiety and administrative fatigue, I think makes it a, a year that's going to have many challenges. Um, and we should talk about that administrative fatigue that I think some heads of school did not take adequate time this summer to recharge and refuel. They insisted that their administrative team take time, but they didn't necessarily take their own advice. And, and there, is, there is definite exhaustion going on. So this, this gets to a really challenging moment for, for anybody who's in academic leadership in schools, right? Like, add to, I, I would add, the only thing I'd add to your list of, of additional challenges is it's, there's still a ton of trauma that is happening within communities as well as the pandemic continues to rage on. So all of those things together make these jobs really difficult. Are you seeing as well um, in addition to kind of just general increased expectations, a demand for greater flexibility too. That gets into some of our talk about millennials. Yeah, yeah. So let's go. Let's go there. Yeah. I think 
I'm never wild about all the generalizations that are made about millennials, mm -hmm. but some of them do stick. We're talking about that generation born between what, 1981 and 1996. And I'm the mother of a, a millennial who's a digital native who saw 9-11, who saw the Great Recession and, and now has seen a pandemic. And he wants flexibility. But the other quality that I notice about millennials is what I used to call the Starbuckization. Uh, <laughs> where they want everything customized. You don't just walk in and order a cup of coffee. You order it half calf, half decaf with skim milk. My administrative assistant um, worked in Starbucks administrative offices at one point in their corporate offices. And she said when she first started, she had to work in a store so that she'd know from the ground up what it was like. She, she said she'll never forget the woman who walked in one morning and told them exactly what temperature to make their coffee. So millennials want this customization and they want that from our schools too. And that leads to your theme of flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. That, okay, so you've got in-person learning going on, but what about that hybrid? What about the online learning? What about when I want to go to Vail? Uh, right. I, I think it's going to be one of those themes that will run through this year, Brad. Do you? I, I do. And I think that they're just going to tie together like the, the big quit, the big the great resignation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this theme around flexibility for families, people mm -hmm. do not want anymore. And I don't think this is unique to millennials. I think this is, this is more kind of an outcome of COVID that, uh, mm -hmm people do not want their lives to revolve around their job or revolve around their kid's school in this new, in this new world. And that's gonna create huge shifts, both within our workforces and within what students and families expect, don't you think? Uh, one of our schools had a motto last year for its um, remote learning saying, blah, 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 school, any place, anywhere. Mm. Any time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I think it's such an interesting way of looking at opportunity in education. You know, Carol, it's, it's interesting. This is bringing me back to discussions that we had on our academic leaders list over the su summer were really robust around basically what are you pulling back from? If last year we said yes, yes, yes to pretty much everything, there was a lot of discussion about saying no, 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 and pulling back some of the expectations that we have and setting new expectations for families. But what I'm hearing you say too, is that there is also an opportunity that we may miss if we don't think about our programs more flexibly going forward. And that doesn't mean saying yes to everything, but it means making decisions that help your program become more flexible in the future. Is that right? I think you've got it exactly right, Brad. Do you remember that famous Pat Bassett quote, Pat would always say, um, schools are very good at addition and very bad at subtraction. <laughs> add, 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 but then deciding what to take away. And, but I think we're at a juncture now where you shouldn't think about it as taking away, but reframing. Mm, interesting. And with that sense of flexibility, driving it. I, that, that's great. And, and Carol, we've gotten in a question. I just remind folks, please add to this conversation through the Q&A. Please hit the Q&A button and add to that. Erica notes here, um, I'm not a millennial, Gen X here. Me too, Erica. And I can agree that more flexibility is definitely something I'm interested in too. During the initial sub shutdown, I found that telework was really beneficial for much of my job. For this year, I requested part of my job involved telework and thankfully my school agreed and was able to accommodate. Do you think more schools will consider this for faculty moving forward? Boy, is that a great question, Erica. I, in the corporate world, um, the studies reveal that remote working has 
has been good and productivity has been good. And so finding the flexibility in the corporate world is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. I think with schools, it's a little different and it depends on the age range of the child you're teaching. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a hard one. I think it's worthy of conversation and worthy of, of exploration within schools. Brad, you could probably come up with five scenarios where a teacher could have some greater flexibility. Yeah, and before we get into the teaching core too, it's certainly clear that different offices on campus will probably have greater flexibility in the future in part to retain uh, or recruit top talents of those positions. I mean, already I think pre-pandemic, there were some folks in advancement offices or communication offices or business offices of the school that were, uh, that were not always on campus doing their job. They were teleworking at least some percentage of their time. It seems to me that's an obvious place that's gonna to continue to increase over time. I, I think Erica's question really about teaching core is super interesting in part because it's really talking about the planning time that teachers need. And that becomes really difficult uh, as everybody who's ever been in a classroom knows uh, if you're sitting in your departmental office and kids are coming by every 10 seconds too. There's a beauty to that and something we don't wanna lose, right? It's awesome to have the kid come by for a little extra help or to come talk through a difficult topic with you or whatever it might be. And yet at the same time, it's difficult also in those moments to plan in the same way. So we started to see some schools think about having um, having asynchronous learning days or other days where maybe nobody is on campus in that same way that we used to assume that for 180 days a year, we all had to be on campus at the same time. So I think some, some tweaks on that, we started to see some schools think about, you know, are we only doing half days on Fridays in person? And then maybe Friday afternoon is something that we do a little bit more asynchronously. So I think we'll start to see some changes at the margins, but Carol, you're absolutely right. The teaching job is such that a full flexible option in most schools, unless they have you know, robust online learning components is probably not coming in the near term. Yeah. Brad, I wanna go back to some other um, considerations about yeah. meals, um, that concept of loyalty. Mm, yeah, yeah, let's go back to that. I think you would find very few millennial parents um, striving for 30 years in the same job and getting the gold watch at the retirement party. Millennials yeah. yeah. um, are think change is good. Um, but they also prize value. Mm. And how our schools communicate and, and demonstrate value to the parents, I think is critically important. Sending that little photo home, oh, here was Johnny doing whatever. Mm -hmm. Make a working parent's day. And then that other thing about millennials, um, they read reviews. Mm. Who goes to Amazon without reading a review? Look at TripAdvisor and its popularity. So I think school people need to be aware of, of the reviews about their, their school, whether it's rate my teacher or God forbid niche, you know, niche gave highest ratings to a school in New Jersey that closed. Um, um, but being sure that the school is well represented with accurate data to the NCES data bank so that at least those horrible ranking places that pull information from standard data banks are getting accurate and up-to-date things. I think those are, are important things for schools to pay attention to. Well, let's, let's unpack these, Carol, because you've said a lot there that's super important for folks to be considering here. You know, if you tie the question of institutional loyalty to the question of value and to the idea that people are getting information from disparate sources that are not necessarily the direct communication channels from schools anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have to understand that families will be constantly evaluating whether that school is right or not for them, right? This is not a, you start a pre-K and 
you know, unless something goes wrong, you're there through 12. Well, and Brad, there's been a 75% increase in the number of charter schools, i.e. free, and the number of children who are homeschooled has has increased, especially because of the pandemic. Yep. We're dealing with a different competitive pool as well. Which is why I think, you know, in our, in, when we talked before, we worry that some of this increase is ephemeral. Mm-hmm. We worry that we're back to pre-COVID challenges around enrollment if we don't focus really, really carefully on family retention. Mm-hmm. So let's bring that, I'm gonna, I know you wanna comment on that. Let me bring that, um, uh, that pulse survey back up though. You know, on the one hand, this is great that we're seeing tremendous, really more attention towards faculty and staff retention. But if only 52% of folks are focusing more on student and family retention, does that bode well for the future? I don't know. I think there could be greater work done in that area particularly because some of the increase in enrollment came from families that are not the typical independent school families. They are the families that had their kids in public schools in many cases and transferred to our independent schools. And so retaining those families when they could go back to the free public school or free charter school is going to take some effort. And I think it's effort worth expending. And it's effort that's really gonna be concentrated on this year, right? Like this is the, we hope, we hope that we are not still talking about the COVID pandemic in the same way going into next academic year that we were talking about it this year. So if that's true though, then this is the year for a school to really demonstrate its value. But Brad, when I look at that flash survey of yours, the heartening, number on there was the amount of attention being given to faculty retention. Absolutely. Faculty deserve to be recognized and valued. And and if that's happening at that level, that's a really good sign. Don't you think? Oh, it's it's a great sign. It's a great sign that people uh, have gotten that message. I think to your point too, Carol, from before, we also have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Right, and so this is a this is a really really difficult system that we're working in right now. If we're getting pressure to make sure that we're focusing on retention, making sure that we're focusing on value, at the same time that so many of us are exhausted, boy, that's tough. Boy, that's tough. It it seems to me that an administrator who focuses and leans into kind of the servant leadership model is also going to find success um, because they're going to be caring so deeply about the folks that work with them. And that might give them an addition um, that added an extra uh, motivation and satisfaction within their own job, seeing those that work with them thrive. I'm a big believer in vacation therapy, Brad. (laughs) I I hope that all the administrative leaders here are thinking that this upcoming weekend has Indigenous Peoples Friendship Day, whatever it's being called this year, and maybe a long weekend. And not working on Monday, if your school is not in session, would be a very good way to recharge for a day. At least. Yep. So, Carol, any other questions that you think academic leaders should really be thinking about as they go through this year? Anything else that's really top of mind? I know we've hit on huge range of broad topics today. Um, Brad, I ultimately think that life is all about relationships. And I think schools asking themselves that fundamental question about how is my school developing meaningful relationships with all of its constituencies is a refrain that's worth having. I also think that a question about the retention team, Mm. finally one, who serves on that retention team, where are they getting their information? And what are the best methods of communication 
with those people with whom you're trying to establish that relationship. Not everybody likes email. Not everybody likes text. Who wants a phone call? Who wants what? You know, but but those communication methods. Um, I don't know. I, I just think communication service pivoting and not panicking. Yeah. Uh, um, being human and being flexible are some of the the critical components of this year. You know, I, I love what you said there on on two levels. Obviously, the, the relationships you write and, and in independent schools, that's that's nowhere more true than in independent schools. That relationships really is what it comes down to. You know, I know that one of the frustrations, and I'm glad you brought up communication because one of the frustrations that a lot of academic leaders have is the feeling that they've already said that or they've said that. Right. And, and why isn't anybody listening or why isn't anybody coming to the parent coffee or why isn't and I think that there's a little reframe that we can have there. Right. That different people want to be communicated with in different ways. And so part of that, as you say, is knowing how they want to be communicated with. Customizing second, again. What's that? Customizing again. Customizing it. Yeah. And 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 also understanding that we need to create a whole bunch of different ways that we are communicating these things because. For the 10 people that show up at the parent coffee, that was the right way to communicate that. For the 30 people that read the newsletter, that was the right way to communicate that. For the 15 people that want something else, we got to figure out how to get in in front of them too. It's not about anymore being able to say, well, I told you because it was in the weekly newsletter. It's it's much different framework where we're thinking carefully. We call it, and one schoolhouse, the ecosystem of different ways that people can engage with you rather than thinking this is the one way to do it. Well, um, folks, thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar. And Carol, I can't thank you enough. It is always a pleasure to have some time to chat with you um, and to talk about these big issues. I think you're wonderful. I think you're doing such important work there at One Schoolhouse. And everyone should know that when Brad asks you to do something, there's one refrain and that's yes. Well, you are too kind, my friends. Good talking to you and uh, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks. Stay safe and stay well, everyone. Thanks for having me, Brad. Take care. Bye-bye.